we shouldn't have to say this, but we will because it's necessary. Ezekiel did not see a UFO. What was it? Welcome to Skywatch TV for Wednesday, June 1st, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. Before we get to our guest today, remind you that uh, this week, the official launch of the blockbuster new book from best-selling authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, and The Vatican's Last Crusade. For $19.95 plus shipping and handling, more than $200 worth of books, audios, and other research information will be sent to you to find out how you can get ad- take advantage of that deal. Make sure you watch through the end of this program. Now, our guest, somebody who can actually read ancient Sumerian and thus knows what it was that Ezekiel saw, the author of the book, The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible, Dr. Michael Heiser. Mike? Um, so we hear from folks like Von Daniken and Sokolos that uh, the wheel within a wheel was actually a UFO and just the ancient Hebrew prophets didn't know what they were looking at, and so they described it in terms that they could understand. Right. Um, and what's just, what and, say you? <laughs> and just coinc- coincidentally didn't use words for round and silvery and disc. Yeah, know, exactly. That, that are in the biblical Hebrew vocabulary. Yeah, they, they, had, they had plates back in the day. Right, they could, yeah. yeah, called it a flying plate, yeah. if not a saucer. Yeah, I, again, I, I think this is a good example of uh, not only ancient astronaut nonsense, but also just ancient astronaut um, sort of lack of investigative ability or even interest. Because this is an example, even though it gets trucked out so often, this is actually an example of you can find what Ezekiel was actually talking about. We have, and I like to say, the Polaroids of the day, (laughs) and that is statuary, iconography, of all of the elements that you find in Ezekiel 1. I've blogged about this before on on my Paleo Babel blog and a few other places, and I invariably get asked this on shows like Coast to Coast AM. People are convinced, you know, that this is a UFO. And again, I don't know what you can really say to someone who's a committed believer in that other than go look at the evidence, Mm -hmm. but the evidence is actually there. And we know what Ezekiel was looking at. We have all the elements in the artwork of the day, and it wasn't a flying saucer. To me, it's actually something more interesting. Hmm. Now, I've talked with Josh Peck about this as we discussed his book, Cherub and Chariots. Um, What was it that and, and I'll put a gra- p- picture of the graphic uh, on okay. the screen as you were discussing this because I think that's uh, interesting for people to see. Um, what? Why is it that that the ancient Near Eastern people would have known what Ezekiel was describing? I mean, what what sort of cultural mm-hmm. imagery was he drawing upon that would have been common to all of them? Yeah. And, and why do you find it even more interesting than it being a UFO? I mean, <laughs> what could be more interesting than that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th- I think I think. Biblical theology is more interesting than your <laughs> No, I, it would have been familiar to people because the the iconography used in Ezekiel 1 is familiar with uh, familiar to the average person because it's associated with royalty. So any kind of royal procession, any kind of il- illustration of the king on his throne, uh, and again, we still have plenty of examples of this, cherubim throne, where this was sort of a stock element of the description, you have a, a throne, you know, on a round platform surrounded by cherubim, you know, d- the number varies. They have wings, okay, mm-hmm. they have bovine, you know, legs and all this sort of stuff. It, it, it's all, again, the stock elements of what the royal throne and the royal throne guardians, you know, would look like, mm-hmm. the, you know, what they were considered to look like. And in Ezekiel's case, you know, the, the term cherubim is actually something that comes from Akkadian, the karuv mm-hmm. or the karibu, again, which is this creature, this sort of, you know, weird looking creature with wings and bovine features and whatnot. But their job was to guard the divine presence. And in, the, in this case, the king, again, being viewed as the divine representative, you guard the king. Mm-hmm. So people are seeing this imagery a lot. Again, anytime they're looking at artwork that's, you know, around the city or whatever, or the king comes through town on a beer or whatever, you know, there it is. What it means, though, is to me what's significant. Uh, other, you know, I didn't come up with this. You'll actually get this in good commentaries. But the four faces of the cherubim are not coincidentally the four cardinal points of the Babylonian zodiac. Hmm. In other words, the, you know, we use the expression four corners of the earth. Mm-hmm. Okay? It's the same kind of thinking, north, south, east, west. And the, the facial representations or the iconographic representations of that correspond to these cherubim. And you say, well, why, why Babylonian? Well, it's Ezekiel. 
Okay, he's the in book Babylon. opens, he's in Babylon. <laughs> They're sitting there by the river Kivar wondering, why are we here? We're the people of God. What's going on? You know, here we are in Babylon. And so it, it becomes really important. What, what Ezekiel's doing is he has, you know, the four corners of the earth, as it were, the four cardinal points of the zodiac, and you, you have the deity enthroned over them, as if to say, well, the enthroned deity really controls the cosmos. It controls, you know, the, the, the celestial, you know, heavens. Again, think of the zodiac. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, because look, look at the way not just the ancient people looked at the stars, but the way we look at the stars. Mm -hmm. What happens in the heavens dictates time. This is how you measure days and hours and seasons and months. And, you know, it's the passage of time. It's the course of human history. But the key is Ezekiel takes all of this imagery that people in Babylon, the Babylonians are going to associate with Marduk, okay, the God who supposedly conquered the Israelites mm -hmm. and their God. Mm -hmm. And who does he put on the throne? It's Yahweh, Yahweh of Israel. Yeah, okay. And so it's, it's a message to the, to the captives. Again, Ezekiel 1, that's who he's talking to, the, the, the captives in Babylon, that, yeah, you're here, and you're wondering how in the world did we get here? Because we are the people of God. Has, has Yahweh forsaken us? And the answer is no. You all know why you're here. You you're here because you deserve to be here, because you abandoned the God of Israel. But he is the one who is still in charge of human destiny and your destiny and the destiny of nations. He is the one that controls the course of time and all the events of human history within it. He's still on the throne. So it, it's, it's a really theologically pregnant passage. If you understand the imagery and really the cosmic dimensions mm -hmm. of the imagery and what Ezekiel's trying to get them to, to, to believe, to embrace in faith in, in their circumstances. Hmm. So you're right. That is more interesting than the possibility <laughs> that he was visited by... Uh, <laughs> Aliens from Zeta Reticuli or something. Right. Who need to ride uh, crazy looking animals to go from uh, yeah, to go from place one, to place. Yeah, one celestial object to another. Well, uh, what I think is interesting too is that the Caribbean were known to other ancient cultures. This was not something that only the Israelites knew. Mm -hmm. At some point, the Akkadians and the Babylonians and the Sumerians presumably mm -hmm. had, had been exposed to. Yeah, in, in the case of like Sumerian and of course Babylonian, Akkadian, uh, all of all of those languages are, are were in the uh, the discourse, the the common geography there, Mesopotamia. They're all Mesopotamian uh, languages, at least you know written languages. Sumerian script is a little bit different than Akkadian script and all that sort of stuff. But even even outside that orbit, Akkadian, for instance, is a Semitic language, and Hebrew is a Semitic language. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to have common vocabulary. Uh, you know, ideas expressed with that common vocabulary. So it, it's not going to be a, a surprise if some of the same terminology shows up to describe, in this case, the roles of a divine guardian. Now, in Egypt's instance, it's different. Egypt, Egyptian is not a Semitic language, you know, strictly speaking. It's called Hamato-Semitic. It's something different. Mm -hmm. But in Egyptian thinking, who were the throne guardians there? They were the seraphs. Mm. Okay, seraphim. Mm -hmm. Okay, we get that in Isaiah 6, and you say, well, why is Isaiah 6, why does that have an Egyptian theme? It's because of who Hezekiah and Uzziah and, and Ahaz, you know, the, the Israelite kings there, who the big political ally was. Egypt. Because if right. you use Egyptian trappings for your iconography, and, and people can go up and Google and just Google Hezekiah's seal. Yes. I it see. has an Egyptian scarab on it. Right, well, right. Well, why is that? It's because if I'm an Israelite king and I'm just a little, I got, I'm in charge of two little tribes here. We're not much. But if you're going to pick on us, okay, here's our ally. We're using Egyptian symbolism, and that's, that's going to telegraph something. You want us? You've got to go through them because mm -hmm. we're buddies. Now, God, the prophets say, don't do this. Right. Egypt is a reed that breaks, right. you know, don't cuts the do hand this. of those who lean on it. Yeah. But politically, that's what, they're, you know, that, that's what they're telegraphing. That's what they're doing. And, and again, the prophets are trying to, to get them to trust God instead. But this is just historically where they were at, and it gets mm. reflected in the, in the text. Mm. Again, so Ezekiel just using imagery that would have been familiar to the people mm -hmm. who were reading it in the time in that, that he was context, writing it. Yep. So in instead of us in the 21st century trying to impose our right. Western scientific worldview sure. onto the ancient text, um, what about the UFOs that are supposedly recorded in medieval art? Yeah, th this is, as, as a friend of mine at work says about something totally different, I could mock this for weeks. <laughs> and, and honestly, I, I could, but it, it's really not because of, of any work that I've done. Uh, there are no UFOs in medieval art. If, don't take Mike's word for it. I'm going to give you this guy's name, Diego Cuohi. 
C-U-O-G-H-I. Now I have links to his work on my website and on my blog. He is an art historian and he has a whole website. Most of it's in English. He's translated it into English. Some of it's in Portuguese, but the bulk of it is in English. And he has dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of the kinds of things that get, you know, put off on the public as UFOs and medieval art. Mm -hmm. And he even has the, the ones that people use under greater magnification. And they're just things like rings of angels. Hmm. Or in one case, the, the, the saucer is actually Jerome's hat. <laughs> okay, that shows up in, in dozens and even hundreds of paintings. It was an artistic little, you know, motif that was again designed to communicate certain ideas. So if you're living in the Renaissance, well, you know what that is. It's just a, a, it, it's a, it's a calling card. It's, it's a thing you drop in there mm -hmm. uh, artistically. And so Kuogi has, has just a wonderful site that goes through all of these examples. You know, what about the, 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 the two faces in the spacecraft next to the cross? It's sun and moon. Okay, it, it, it's very, he, again, he has dozens of other examples that show you in a, in a wider context, wider viewing context. This is what it is. And well, why, why is that? Well, it's because, again, the, the heavens, you know, the, that everybody thought, you know, were, were either created by God or, you know, maybe divine themselves in antiquity, that sort of thing. They're mourning the loss of their creator. Hmm. Again, it, it's an artistic motif to communicate a specific idea. Hmm. It has nothing to do with, oh, there's aliens visiting us here. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a wonderful site and a wonderful yeah. resource. And as though so, somehow uh, a painting from the 15th or 16th century is supposed to convey some historical event that happened at the time of Christ. Right, Yeah. right. Well, Mike's website, DRMSH for Dr. Michael S. Heiser, DRMSH.com. Uh, the podcast is the Naked Bible podcast, his blog's Naked Bible, Paleo Babble, and UFO religions where you get little nuggets like this. And Mike, we sure appreciate it because yeah, it's nice thanks. bringing some sanity to an <laughs> insane world. Um, he will be a guest on a number of upcoming episodes on Skywatch TV. Please make sure you catch those and you can find out when and where by logging on to skywatchtv.com. This week, we discuss the Vatican's long fascination with what they think might be coming from the skies. The Vatican Observatory down in uh, Mount Graham, Arizona, Mount on Mount Graham in Arizona. And... Um, how the Vatican's interpretation of old prophecies like uh, Fatima and the prophecy of the popes may culminate in a conflict with the Islamic State and its so-called prophecy of the final conflict with Rome. Skywatch TV airs on the Cornerstone Network Coast to Coast again Saturday on the Victory Television Network and the Christian Television Network. The program also available now on the Skywatch TV channel on Roku. And if you need instructions on how to add the Skywatch TV channel to your Roku account, you'll find that posted at skywatchtv.com slash Roku. And speaking of streaming video, don't forget the uh, Rocky Mountain International Prophecy Conference can come direct to your home. Three different packages available, 32 presentations from 25 speakers, and all of those presentations archived for six weeks after the conference. For more information and to sign up, log on to prophecywatchers.com. If you have comments or questions for me, please send those to dgilbert at skywatchtv.com. And thanks for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. Coming exclusively from Skywatch TV for a very limited time starting May 31st, 2016. When you purchase the new book and final report from Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, The Final Roman Emperor, The Islamic Antichrist, and The Vatican's Last Crusade, you'll receive the largest giveaway of 2016, an unprecedented value of over $200 in free books, DVDs, audio files, and a data DVD library with tens of thousands of pages of ancient literature no longer available, as well as movies, WikiLeaks files the government does not want you to see, and more for your library or to give away as gifts. Included in this biggest giveaway of 2016 are Chris Putnam's full-length DVD presentation, Astrobiology and the Vatican ET Connection, the new five-part Skywatch TV special investigative report on the book, The Final Roman Emperor, plus two mystery books with a $40 value, and a data DVD library with thousands of pages of ancient literature, movies, and audio series for your library or to give away as gifts. 
And for the first several thousand customers, while supplies last, you'll also receive Satan's Dirty Little Secret, the two demon spirits that all demons get their strength from. Satan, you can't have my promises. The spiritual warfare guide to reclaim what's yours. What happens when I die? True stories of the afterlife and what they tell us about eternity. Becoming a prayer warrior, a guide to effective and powerful prayer. An unprecedented value of over $200 in never before offered free products. And the biggest giveaway of 2016, yours absolutely free when you purchase the final Roman Emperor from SkywatchTV.com for only $19.95 plus shipping, beginning May 31st. But be advised, this astonishing promotion is limited to first come, first serve while supplies last. So it's urgent, beginning May 31st, 2016. You place your order for the final book and biggest prediction yet in this four-year investigation by internationally acclaimed best-selling authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. The final Roman Emperor, the Islamic Antichrist, and the Vatican's Last Crusade for only $19.95 plus shipping. This offer is on a limited time basis and will end without notification. So be sure to visit skywatchtv.com to follow the updates in the countdown to the biggest giveaway of 2016. Order the new book by Tom Horn and Chris Putnam on May 31st to receive the unprecedented value of over $200 while supplies last. Free products limited to quantity on hand and may be replaced by products of equal value.